So the Labour administration under the leadership of Keir Starmer, they want to achieve net zero electricity by 2030. Now, this raises a lot of problems, which we are going to explore in this video. And I'm also going to tell you how nuclear can play a bigger role in the UK and why it should. But we're also going to explain why 2030 is not that great of a target. So first, they aim to, you know, decarbonize the UK electricity production by 2030. We have a couple of uh, news articles about this. So this is a news article by The Guardian, uh, which is basically a fact check. Then we have another uh, article by the BBC. Again, they're, you know, asking questions whether the whether the uh, the administration can actually do this uh, by 2030 so I'm, I'm i'm taking most of the stuff that's in these two articles i'm going to summarize it for you and then there's finally uh, e die i don't know how to um, we would say 80 uh, and they basically outlined that naso is the national energy system administrator they say that it should be possible uh, to get to net zero by 2030. I have questions, <laughs> let that be clear. But first, uh, just have a look at the, the, the energy landscape of the UK, right? So what you see here, all these yellow uh, placeholders over there, all of those are natural gas plants. So if I go and zoom into uh, Liverpool, for instance, well, that one hasn't been built. <laughs> it, it, it is being built, but over here, for instance, you can see this here is clearly a natural gas plant as you can see the the, the 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 turbines and this chimney everything that's over here over here you have the cooling infrastructure i believe that this is a very small turbine and then over here you have the the uh, transformer and transmission station so when we zoom out uh, the uk has a sizable fleet of natural gas uh gas plants it's i believe it's roughly 30 gigawatts at this moment so the guardian did a fact check so basically if they do this if they enact this plan uh, then they will not end their dependence on fossil fuels it will be net zero uh, but it will not be you know it, it it won't make the uk close all its gas plants and close all its biomass plants they will still be operational and still be around at that time they say that roughly 35 gigawatts will be needed on standby in 2030 and that's sizable and the question is how expensive is it going to be to keep all these plants waiting for the moment when they actually need to ramp up and produce electricity when all this renewables that they have built isn't available they also say that they need about 43 gigawatts of offshore wind. This is the lowest estimate. The highest estimate is somewhere around 50 gigawatts. And they have 15 gigawatts today. So they need to build at least 28 gigawatts in six years, which is something that they have not done uh, before. There's no precedent for this kind of uh, growth. Uh, so so, so I, I really question whether this is going to be reached or not and the other big thing is they need 3800 kilometers of new power lines uh, this is not even distribution this is just transmission high voltage line so a thousand kilometers over land and 2800 kilometers offshore that's basically cables lying on the seabed being very vulnerable for whenever russia decides it wants to wreck the offshore infrastructure and they also only account for 4.1 gigawatts of nuclear and 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 why that's relevant is is something that we are going to see later on so the bb the bbc they uh, they did did something similar so they say that more than four times as much battery capacity needs to be connected than is available these days uh, contracting for as much offshore wind power in the next one to two years as we've seen in the past six achieving carbon capture and storage targets using technology that has not yet been delivered at scale which is very important because you know everybody's talking about ccs so you know whether this is a big thing or not but at this moment it's just that dead on arrival and this one is especially juicy so they need a fourfold increase in flexibility of demand 
flexibility of demand, getting the retail market to respond to price signals using smart meters that actually work. So what are these smart meters going to do? Are they going to shut down your fridge? Are they going to say, okay, uh, washing machine, stop doing what you're doing? Uh, does it turn off our TV or my computers? What is it going to do? What does this even mean? And also, if we look at the, the energy flow diagram, then we will see that electricity is not even that important. So let's go to the energy flow diagram. Uh, this is the one that the UK has offered to us. Unfortunately, they made it with very small letters. Uh, so so it's, it's going to be hard to explain. But what, basically what you see over here on the left-hand side is 280. 38 million tons of oil equivalent that is needed to power the, the, the economy of the United Kingdom. Uh, you can also see that, you know, there's about 70 uh, million tons of uh, exports. Uh, they still lose about 25 uh, million tons. But the, the interesting bit over here is in the middle. So this pink line that you see over here, that's electricity. And if you compare the pink line to the purple line, the purple line is gas. So you can see a lot of this gas is going into domestic and into, into the industry. The domestic usage for gas in Northwestern Europe is generally heating of homes, heating of water uh, and cooking. So there's more gas going into these homes than there's electricity, which is what you usually see. Uh, and, and what you also see over here, the, the bottom lines, those are petroleum related. So you get the, 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 the bluish line that's for transport, mainly gasoline, diesel and those kind of things. And then you get your oil refineries. That's also uh, a way to export energy, which is happening in the UK. And finally, you've got your crude, which is the green. So if we go to a, I've tried to simplify this picture a little bit. So what you see over here is this is the primary input, 238 million tons of oil equivalent. Needed for non-electricity is 178.4, 70 of which is exported. You also have 42 uh, million tons of oil equivalent in losses, which is a lot. You need roughly 51.2 a million tons for electricity production and you only effectively use 27 million tons so if we go to uh to the 27 million tons and you divide that by the 238.6 then you get 11.3 percent so 11 so electricity basically is 11.3 percent of all the energy that gets put into the UK economy. And, and, and this is really a big deal. So yes, if you can manage to decarbonize electricity production by 2030, that still doesn't mean that you have decarbonized your economy. Far from it. You're still a long, 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 long way away from having decarbonized you know, your economy. So... Uh, what I believe is that some of these people are basically they're trying to celebrate too early uh, because a lot of this stuff still will get electrified, which will uh, again add more demand on the electricity side. Um, you know, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if the effective electricity usage would double by 2040 or, may, or maybe even triple. So Concentrating as much on offshore wind and solar and natural gas with CCS as the UK is doing, it's nice if you want to reach your 2030 goal, but afterwards you're still a long way removed from reaching net zero for your economy. So it would be much smarter now to say, okay, we need to we need to focus on the short term. Correct, but it's much smarter to start thinking about what we need to do afterwards. And, you know, what can we do by 2035? And what can we do by 2040? What can we do by 2045? And what can we do by 2050? You need to plan this out better, not just making it a pie in the sky, but you actually can plan a route towards a real uh, problem solution.
So this is where the fun begins. This is what Anakin Skywalker says, especially with the current plan, you know, having the 35 gigawatts of gas plants that are being parked somewhere, uh, the compounding problems then start. Uh, what do we mean by compounding? You, you have your first investment for renewables, your windmills, your solar panels, all that hardware. That requires a large chunk of money in order to get built. But in order to make sure that all these uh, windmills and solar panels get attached to the grid, to the end user, you need a lot of transmission lines, another chunk of money that you need for that investment. You need a lot of distribution lines in order to make sure that, you know, everything branches out, it, th that the capacity is need is there when needed. Another chunk of money that you need to put in. Uh, you also need to have your backup, you know, batteries and such, uh, which is going to add another chunk of money. And in the end, you have layered so many investments on top of each other that the cost for the entire system has become very, very high. And that's what we what we see happening everywhere. We see it happening in Germany. I bet that we are going to see it in the UK as well. So uh, the, the issue here is why uh, don't they see this? Why do they keep heading in this direction while well, if they think this through from a, you know critically they see that they're they, they might be on a rightish path but they're not on the right path right so that's why i always say okay why not include more nuclear right and the logic is sound the more nuclear you add the less compounding you have to do because you know one nuclear power station of one gigawatt can do the work of three gigawatts of solar when the sun is shining. And when the sun doesn't shine, something else has, ha, has to produce the power that is needed by, you know, that is, that is used by all these consumers of electricity. The nuclear power plant is always there. So it reduces the compounding issue. Now, there's also some problems with nuclear, especially in the United Kingdom, because Hinkley Point C has damaged the UK's confidence that it can do nuclear fast and cheap. I mean, Hinkley Point C is, is now en route to become the most expensive nuclear power plant ever built. Uh, and this is not good. Uh, and this is this is especially bad if everybody then gets put off by nuclear. So if you want to talk about nuclear as being a solution, everybody brings up Hinkley Point C. And, and that's basically where all the discussions then end. You, you either double down, you're going to say, you know, you can do better. or And the other people say, listen, it's eye-wateringly expensive. And, and there's just no solution in sight. So what I would do, if you would ask me, I would commit to roughly 20 gigawatts of nuclear power in the UK. I think the 20 gigawatts should be uh, should be doable. And that's roughly five times uh, as much nuclear as is, you know, um, as is being planned for in the 2030 number. And how would we then make sure that nuclear becomes uh, cheaper? And how can we make sure that we can deploy these nuclear power plants faster? Uh, that's by doing a national program. Uh, yes, you can still work with uh, private companies who have to basically make sure that these power plants get built. These are contractors and all that kind of stuff. But you have to improve and increase the ability of your workforce so that they can actually plan and execute nuclear construction projects on time, on budget, and each and each new power plant gets built a little bit cheaper and a little bit faster than the previous one because you actually learn something from building the first one. So I wouldn't even be I would even I would even advocate for the United Kingdom to still do uh, EPRs. Right, because they have experience with Hinkley Point C, but I, I would only I would only say that they should do EPR if they actually made sure that they learned that they learned everything they could learn from building Hinkley Point C, and they know how to do it fifteen percent faster in, in the next unit or or, or thirty percent faster in the next unit, and that's the whole point. Commit to excellence. Th that's what I really want to advocate for. So 
if we go to UK nuclear potential, right, what we see here, another map of the United Kingdom with place markers at all the places where they used to be uh, nuclear power plants or where there are still nuclear power plants operational. So over here uh, in, in the east, we have Sizewell. Then over here, we have Hartle Pool. I, I hope I, I, I pronounced that correctly. So Hartle Pool. Then if we go uh, up north a little bit, uh, that's where we get Torness, right? Torness. And uh, finally, let's see, the last one operational is Haitian. That one's over there. It's in the armpit. <laughs> Haitian, right? So this is th these are the only operational nuclear power plants in the UK. And if you look at you know the color, so the orange ones, those are nuclear power plants where I expect that no new nuclear will ever get built or where it is not an option to simply look at this one over here it's built quite away uh it's it's built you know quite a little distance away from the sea um it, it, it's suboptimal you really want to be right next to the water and you want to have uh, access to cooling water so over here down here this is wilfa we do know that they are they really want to build two large units here somewhere so that's why i made this one purple and that's uh, that's the explainer for why there are purple markers on there those are the places where we can expect that they will build new nuclear power plants in the future so over here you have bradwell right this is the bradwell nuclear power station then we have dungeness over here down in the south right dungeon dungeness and there's plenty of room over here so maybe they can realize a new nuclear power plant over here or maybe somewhere else uh in any case uh, th this is this is hinkley point c this is the largest construction project um as you can see they, they already are finishing the containment building of uh, of the first unit and then the second unit will get its get, get its get its uh, containment dome which is currently being constructed over here so as you can see many of these components that are eventually put onto these reactor buildings are actually constructed on site so i think that there is plenty of uh plenty of uh, potential for the uk especially if you take uh, if you take into consideration all the other plants that have been shut down or are shut down for instance over here in wales right over here there used to be a operational coal fired power plant i believe that 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 one is no longer in use so maybe you can build a new nuclear power plant over there um over here this is interesting right this is this is quite small but if we go over here so this is the medway over here uh this is the the thames right that goes that goes to london this is the medway and, and there's there's a lot of power and energy infrastructure over here for instance there used to be a power plant over here uh there's still a gas plant over here as you can see but you you might as well build a nuclear power plant at that location or over here right king's north substation there used to be a coal plant here as well you know these are interesting sites where new nuclear power stations could be realized so getting back to the numbers how much nuclear is left and this is really a sad story because it doesn't look good for nuclear at this moment online we still have roughly six gigawatts but 5.3 gigawatts is about to close before the 20 before 2030 and if we go to um to the uh, to the wikipedia page over here you can see it this is this is the the table with all the operational nuclear power plants as you can see Hartlepool, Haitian 1 and 2, Torness and Size will be and they're all except Size will be our plan are, are, are about to close before 2030, 2028, 2028 so and then 2026 and 2026 so they're going to lose roughly two and a half gigawatts of nuclear power in 2026 and they are going to lose roughly 2.6 gigawatts of nuclear power by 2028 now this is going to be offset by the 
uh, coming online of Hinkley Point C1 and 2, 3.3 gigawatts. And let's hope that they eventually do actually start constructing Sizewell C uh, because that would add another 3.3 gigawatts. But you can see they also lost 3.2 gigawatts since 2020, Hunterston B, Hinkley Point P, and Dungeness B. So that's not that's not good news. Um, if the UK really wants to make sure that electricity is still uh, available whenever you need it at a decent price that you don't have to become a weatherman you know <laughs> because this is something that most people don't understand if you actually have to do um, if you actually have to start looking at what the electricity prices are going to do because you're you have a a, a flexible contract with your supplier for instance then you have to be very cognizant of what the weather is doing, when the electricity prices are going to spike, when they are going to drop, whenever, you know, if you have net metering, should you stop net metering because the price has become negative? I mean, these are all re very real and tangible questions at this moment, real relevant questions, because that's what's happening in some places. Some people have these flexible contracts already and they really need to switch off their, their PV system when they notice that the prices go negative because otherwise they should be paying back to their uh, net supplier. You know, uh, they, they do this net metering thing. So they say, okay, well, at that moment you were delivering electricity onto the grid, but the prices were negative. So now you have to pay us for the electricity that you put onto the grid, which is really going to be a big problem in the future when we don't pay attention. So to summarize, adding nuclear, making sure that you allow for nuclear to come online by 2035 or 2040, and make it also making sure that you, you, you really don't have to over-invest as much as you're doing now with wind and solar and, and your battery and all the other compounding issues. I think that that is a smarter way to go. Uh, in any case, it, it looks like all this weird pricing stuff is already locked in. Uh, you can't really avoid it because the inertia of, of, of these plants, the, the whole volume of wind and solar that needs to be built and, and that is going to be provisioned in this year and in the next year, that's simply going to be locked in. So that's going to deliver loads and loads and loads of problems for a lot of people who don't realize it today. In any case, whatever you do, UK, please, please, please put a little bit more emphasis on, on nuclear. Uh, increase your ambition. Make sure that you train a workforce that can can build these uh, these these cathedrals of energy, and, and, and maybe then uh, in the end you will end up with a stable electricity system that is affordable and that will make sure that the economy of the UK remains operational now and with that you've made it to the end of this video i want to thank my patreon supporters for sticking with me please if you want to help me uh pay the bills uh, become a paying member on patreon and if you want to add something to the discussion please let me know down below in the comments leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already thank you all for watching may the strong force be with you Bye bye Thank <laughs> you.